Welcome to the E9 Podcast, hosted by me, Seth Harshman, and my friend Steve Jones. Our goal is to talk with people from a variety of backgrounds and who are at different parts of their journey with Enneagram and get them to share their story with us. In this episode, we're talking with Nate Croft, a three. He's the founder and executive director of Here Here, that's H-E-R-E-H-E-A-R, which is a non-for-profit focused on raising awareness around mental illness. So in this episode, we talk about the intersection of the Enneagram and mental illness. Nate was also generous enough to talk about his own struggles with bipolar disorder. He even tells me what the Enneagram may have to do with why he finished his PhD and I didn't finish it. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Sitting here with two fives, like yeah, there's gonna be lots of <laughs> lots of silence. Like, like there's like looking at each other, and looking at me, and like so. Hey Nate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Seth. You're welcome. Thanks, Steve. Hi. So Nate's a good friend of ours from college. It's yep. good to see him again. We don't live all that far away, but you know how it is with family and work and all that. We don't see each other a whole lot. It, it's really good to have him here. Aside from the fact that I'm pretty sure Nate's going to have great things to say, it's good to just spend time with a friend. So Nate, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Well, so there's a whole bunch of different ways that the Enneagram kind of connects with me. Number one is I got a PhD in theology, so I can do I do all the theological kind of back mm-hmm. work and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, number two is that I have a wife and kids and my wife, we did the Enneagram, like kind of looking at it and stuff. And we actually took tests online and she like nailed a number two. Like if you could put a number two, like, and put them up on like a pedestal, like that would be my wife. The third thing is that I have uh, bipolar disorder and I work with people with mental illness, um, all day, every day and, and write about it and do that kind of stuff. I run an organization called here, here, um, and I'll plug it, you know, H E R E H E A R dot org. And, uh, and so, um, so my, my interest in personality tests and, and things like the Enneagram is how can I use these to help people that I work with on a, on a daily yeah. basis? And stuff. Yeah. So, and that's, I think, um, the real reason that's something that, that really interests us too. Can you tell us, start off the bat, like, tell us a little bit more about what you do with Here Here? So we are, Here Here, we started about three years ago. And we do suicide prevention and awareness trainings. Uh, I'm certified through the QPR Institute out of Tacoma, Washington okay. to do those. Um, I go into schools and talk. Steve's had me into his classroom a couple of times. I go into there, mm-hmm. talk to uh, high school students about mental illness and what it's like to live with a mental illness and what it's like to then help a friend or to reach out on your own if you have a mental illness. And then talk about the importance of, me- of good mental health and stuff, too. Uh, and we slide bullying and, and some other stuff in there because it all kind of interconnects. And then we uh, run a blog on herehere.org. We do, we'll talk with other schools. We do community events. I'm writing a book right now. It's like a, it's a book like if, like say Steve as a, as a teacher was like, this student is struggling. This book would be a place where they could give this, give the student this, this book, this text. Uh, this curriculum and then the student would kind of go through it and there's like a a page to read and then there's like an exercise to do and then steve could go through and look at the exercises and be like oh like they they're kind of struggling maybe they Mm -hmm. need some more help that i can give them and so that's what we're doing putting it together i'm in the middle of writing that right now and then we also pay for counseling for for people so we do a lot that sounds like a lot you put on a festival oh and we put on a music festival yeah Yeah. because that's a lot of fun uh we put on a music and arts festival and in Plymouth every year, and it's a ton of fun. So, and we and we raise awareness, and we have people come in and speak, and we have local bands come in and play, and everyone is always uh, real upbeat about it. The yeah. Whole thing. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Part of the inspiration for that is uh, music's been a big part of your wellness, right? You you've mentioned something like that on occasion. Yeah. But I've never really asked about it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a I I play music. I don't play as much as I used to. I'm playing with a guy in a couple of weeks at a brewery. So, and we get beer. So that's, 
a positive. And I actually, I wrote my dissertation. My dissertation was on attune. Uh, I, I wrote theology as attunement. That when you're doing theology and you're thinking theologically, it's actually more like a musician playing than it is like uh, Einstein doing his thing or something like that. Hmm. So uh, that was interesting. Hmm. I got to quote Jerry Garcia in my dissertation and Trey Anastasio uh, from the bands The Grateful Dead and Fish and uh, and that was fun. Yeah, it was fun. My and you got, you got away with it. Yeah, my dissertation director was like, I never thought I'd see the day. So, um, <laughs> and it's funny, there was a guy after me that did a dissertation. He did political theology as plunder phonics. And plunder phonics is like a hip hop thing hmm. where you, you uh, it, like early, early hip hop, like you would take beats from different, um, like the Beastie Boys, Paul's Boutique is almost a perfect example. Like if you listen to all the different things they mash together, it's, um, it's like they just taken from all these different places hmm. and just throwing it together and stuff. And so that's what he did. So he and I came so back the word, to back. The word there is plunder, like plunder, the, the taking yes. the, yeah, the, you're the taking yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. So plunder phon. I've never heard the term plunder phonics. I know. I drop. I'm going to start trying day. to work it into like daily usage. So that's what. So that's what. Uh, that's kind of where I am, I guess. Thanks for educating our listeners. There's there's going to be like five people who now know the word plunder phonics, and that's really exciting. Uh, and I will. Get, and that's like, including Steve and I. I would like to give. Uh, Bill Myatt, the old, uh, the uh, I'm sure he'll listen to this because you know that's what he does is he listens to everything that I do, so he gets all the credit for that. I know your next question is like, so where do you find yourself on the Enneagram? And <laughs> and that is always his first question. That's always the first question. Yeah, and I and you listen to the podcast then? Like I've listened to them all. Because- so then I'm going to go ahead and reveal that. You're a three, and yeah, that this is yes. part of your preparation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> is that, uh, and we didn't know that uh, coming in. Like, we weren't actually sure how much interaction you had had with it. Like, we didn't even know if we might be starting from scratch. And but you revealed to us you're a three, and so you've you've done your your prep work, which we're excited about. That's that makes things better for us. It is what a three does. Yeah, and I've and I just saw the new the new podcast went up the other day, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna listen to it on the way down, so that I've got all of, all the e nine is listen. is in my all that's available. There is the as yet unreleased episode I've been working on. Oh, yeah, it's just it's just the two of us with no guest, mm-hmm. talking for far and, too long. And it's gonna be yeah, it's gonna be a long one because it's it's the one that where we actually go all around the circle. Oh, and uh, and explain each type. Well, then I'm my next question will then be okay. Um, how, how how are we doing? Are are we we doing okay? Are we? Am do, I? Do you, do you like the podcast? Oh no, us. Oh us. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I, good, I do. Good. I well, do. Thank you. I've yeah, learned. That's, uh, that's I've, nice I've, of you to say so. I've learned a ton actually from the podcast, good. and I've uh, I've become quite can I say enamored with the Enneagram. Like, really, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little. I have my moments, but I'm like, this is this this works, and it it helped me a lot listening to Nux, uh, thing. Nook. Yeah. Nook. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I can never pronounce her name. It's okay. Correctly. I, I, yeah. When I was listening to, to Nook's uh, podcast and uh, number one, that she was a counselor and was using the Enneagram was, mm-hmm. really, was really interesting to me. And then the yep. way that she described it. And then I also think that her personality of the fact that she's the bulldozer with the party hat on. Um, <laughs> yeah. That made a, a big difference because it was like she was fun to listen to. So yeah. She was fun to interview. She definitely like brought some leaven to us, right? Because yeah. we have these, these like deliberate, ponderous personalities, and she she just lightened the whole thing up. It was fun to work with her. Yeah, she kind of carried us. I walked away from that thinking, can we do a podcast where we only interview sevens? <laughs> Turns out, I don't, I don't think we could. You said you listened to to Megan's on the way down. I, I think Megan kind of did the same thing for she, us too. Yeah, yeah, she was a force in a different way. I noticed. And, and she's another one. She's a licensed counselor. Right. She doesn't use the Enneagram as much, but she knows it well and really respects it. When Steve and I were batting around ideas for guests, one of the things that he mentioned about having you on was that last time he had mentioned it or or it had come up, he felt like you were a little bit skeptical of it. Talk yeah. me about maybe like some of the skepticism that you had or maybe still have with it that you carry with you. Well, okay. Number one, I'm a little skeptical of everything. Okay. Um, <laughs> I could get a taco in front of me and be like, I'm not sure about this taco. Mm, I mean, I'm going to eat this, but I'm not positive about it. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm just a little bit, you know, skepticism just kind of comes naturally. So, sure, sure. so my skepticism, it, it kind of comes, uh, I'll say that it's more of a visceral thing. I have taken mm. so many personality tests. Mm, yeah. Um, 
from our alma, alma mater. Um, I just took like eight while I was there, I think. And I got a different type each time. And I finally talked to one of our professors about it. And he was like, there are people that are called chameleons and they just adapt. Hmm. And then I read a three and I was like, well, that makes sense. So <laughs> oh, yeah, this one, this one accounts for that. Yeah. yeah. This one accounts for that. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah. And I've taken other personality tests and I'm just always, I never quite fit into where they would have me fit. So that, that's skeptical number one. And then the other thing is like, I wonder how useful these are outside of okay so I have bipolar disorder mm -hmm. so I've been I've been in regular therapy every at least every two weeks for the last six years sure so I've done a lot of the exploration and stuff like that mm -hmm. I think that sometimes these personality tests and I don't just mean the Enneagram although I think that some people that use the Enneagram do this it mm -hmm. is a way to allow yourself to bypass the really hard work that comes yeah. from mm -hmm. like serious yeah. counseling or mm -hmm. something like that. Like, mm -hmm. And like that's hard work that I would like – like I'm in a pretty good spot now. There was a point where I wasn't. And so like – and I think that the hard work of counseling has really kind of paid that off. So I think the Enneagram as – tool is really helpful like I, I, mm -hmm. like when i read the six i was like okay and when i read the six with a wing four i was like okay that's that's which that doesn't make any sense at all three with a wing four three with a wing four. Oh, okay there we go sorry thank you no, yeah right. i'm not a six we talked about six earlier um and then, yeah and I, so that, some of that is fun too with the bipolar is that i can jump around yeah so I, that's something <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that because that's something i'm really interested in what that might look like yeah that, 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 keep going on your your skepticism and, and okay, where so, that comes in. So but I but the three with the wing four, um, I thought, oh that that sounds like me. Like that sounds mm -hmm. the most like me of any personality test I've ever taken. And so it sounded enough like me that I was like, Hey Trisha, who's my wife, I was like, you need to take this test. And she was like, I don't really want to take the test. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And we sit on our porch a lot and like hang out. And so I was like I finally just brought the computer out to her and was like, take the test. <laughs> So, um, and she did because I wanted more information. Basically, mm -hmm. I wanted to mm -hmm. see how things bounced off, or whatever. So, and when she took the test, she came out as like a two, like flying high two, like the be like the two is two that ever yes. twoed. Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, so you're saying she's a caring person. She's a very caring person, <laughs> giving person, needy person, and one of those people that is like was like she's very much like I don't really care what happens to me as long as, like like mm. like mm. I feel good when you're okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. which is really funny with when you have somebody that like when you live with somebody who's bipolar mm -hmm. and then it's like there's going to be times where I'm just not okay. Like I'm mm -hmm. just not going to be okay. And then she's like, What can I do for you? And I'm like, Nothing. You can do nothing. Yes. You just you can keep asking and that's nice. But you're not gonna be able to do anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but anyway, so so my skepticism is, is kind of revolved around some of that. I read I read Richard Rohr's book. I'm a little skeptical of some of the theology in there. Like, yeah, sure. his theology is a little messy. Let's uh, say. It's, let's just say that he's got a paradigm and he's shoving people into it. Mm -hmm. That uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, let's there, 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 there's there's places. I, his, nice guy, yeah. not a good theologian. <laughs> wow, I think that some of his books I'm like I'm utterly impressed with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that the lady who co-wrote it wrote most of the introductions from what I can It's tell. actually, it's a Andreas Ebert, I think is the name. It's a German it a gentleman. Who, yeah, okay, yeah. well, so. Whichever. I try, to, I, I try to, you know, be the good liberal white guy and read it as a woman whenever good I job. possibly can. Good job. So, uh, yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, so <laughs> the, the white liberal from Plymouth, <laughs> the Indiana. The white liberal from Plymouth, Indiana. Yeah, nice. Yeah. There's one of us. I was a little bit uneasy with that is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. but, sure. Yeah. There are a lot of times when I wish people would stop getting so free and creative with the Enneagram because they're sort of ruining it for the rest of us. Yeah. For those of us who get that there's something, regardless of what kind of truth there is in it, it's a useful tool. And then when people start doing like real goofy stuff with it and like making all kinds of abstract cosmic, you know, and BS connections to things. Yeah. You know, it undermines what authority it actually I mean, has. I, I think itself. I think there's a place to see like how far does this stretch? And if we want to do a project where yeah. we're exploring that, cool. 
Yeah. You don't put it in introduction text. In the introduction book, yes. You know? Yeah, exactly. Well, and the, one of the things that I, was, I thought kept, was kept being interesting is that they kept talking about this true self, and they were talking about people like Nicholas of, Cus- of Cusa or Cusanus, right. um, Evagrius, uh, mm-hmm. Merton, Sufis, the, the Sufis in the Islamic tradition and stuff. And it's like for all of those people, the true self is the no self, like is when the self gets mm. lost into yes. whatever the religious. So like for the yeah. Sufis, it's the 99 names of God. For Merton, it's. I I look into my very self to find that I am no longer there and Christ is there instead of me. Like, yeah. Um, and Kusa and Evagoras would be the same kind of thing. And so it's what like... Paul says, true self is hid with Christ and God. Right. And so it's like, so it's a real mystical, like, I don't know that that true self, the really true self of no self exists in this world. There are momentary places where you can like touch it for a second. And if you look Ooh. at the way other people teaching the Enneagram, they'll still use that term true self, false self, true self. But I don't think it, it's what you're describing, what what Roar's drawing from. Right. I don't, I don't think that it's the same thing. He might be making an, an equivocation there, trying to ground it in, in something that It's more maybe, like higher and looser, lower self, right? Closer to true self. I got that, but again, yeah. I'm a... I'm a so part of my you respect those sources and you don't yeah, like seeing them used those that way. Yeah. And, well, and I also yeah. a lot of my background is in deconstruction in Derrida. Like I've I've studied Jacques Derrida a ton, which will probably make everybody here just get a little. I think they'll be fine with it. No, well, no, no. no. Oh, I just us? saw like Steve like popped up like, ooh, this could be. So like, but uh, but I was I'm just going to be asinine and say, do you mean deconstruction like? I don't believe what I used to believe anymore. God, do I hate that. <laughs> I listen to people talk about, I'm going to deconstruct my faith. And it's like, actually, your faith deconstructs you. And like, you can't just like start, like, you can't just start off on something and be like, I'm going to deconstruct this. Like, it's something that you notice that, that, that comes to fore in a text or a tradition or something like that, like, where there's a... There's a there's a tension there, and you can start to ride that tension out, and then start to t- kind of things come apart, but things mean new things. It's like it's it's really important. Anyway, I have all sorts of tangents to go in on that. <laughs> I spend a lot of my days on Twitter just saying yeah, we you, might bring you, you back. You yeah. can't deconstruct your faith, or at the very least, you mean something different than that. Yeah, yeah. Or and, like like yeah. like my wife is a chef. She has a um, she has a degree in culinary arts, and she has a degree in management. And so we'll go, like, she likes to go to these nice restaurants, and inevitably somebody brings out a deconstructed salad, which basically mm-hmm. means that they didn't put the salad together. They have <laughs> lettuce and oranges <laughs> and, like, dates and, like, some sauce. And Little it's, cubed it's hams. All, yeah. Little and it's all there. Ham. Yeah. It's all there together, and they just didn't put the effort into <laughs> putting it all together. And I'm like, and she's like, look at this salad. And I'm like, they call it a deconstructed salad, and this is just a bunch of pieces of something sitting out. I'm like, why would you have ordered this for me? You know, this is just going to make me angry. And she mm-hmm. she goes, it was the only salad they had on the menu. You know, like whatever. So I figured I'd at least mention that because that's an irritation we both share. And most people just roll their eyes at me uh, or don't understand. We now have an actual Derrida expert to confirm that you are correct and we're putting it out there publicly. So and that's that's all I need. I know that, right? that's all you need. <laughs> This is one of my annoyances with like like things like the Enneagram too, is that like, well, I'm going to use this, I'm going to take this tool and use it to quote unquote deconstruct my faith. The tool as described in Roar and in other people is about getting closer to God or the divine or, mm-hmm. or your true self, you know, whatever that means. To getting closer to a self that is maybe not as chaotic as what your current self is. Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe the best yeah, way to put th- that. Yeah, there's a yeah. lot of ways we could describe yeah. that. that. I think that's a good one though. So don't make this into something that it's not like if you if you're unhappy in your faith and if you're mad at people from the church and and if you've been hurt and that kind of stuff and like, hey, God knows that I have. That's That's legit. Yes. You know, just say that. Don't be like, well, I'm taking a time to deconstruct this thing like things. Anyway, I could go into how I could deconstruct the church or whatever, but that would be a long tangent. I think we're definitely going to have to have you back for that tangent. (laughs) I want that tangent. You want that tangent? I think you're right that maybe now is not the time for it. Well, I don't I don't just want that tangent for me. Can we we can record it? Yeah. We could start another podcast called Tangents. <laughs> tangents. <laughs> E9 Tangents. Cuz we get off on tangents. a lot of great tangents with people that don't make it into episodes. Yeah. Anyway, so 
we've already revealed that you're a you're a three, and at some point I, I do want to get into like where does uh, your bipolar disorder play into that and, and, yeah. and whatnot. But like you said, you know you know the question I normally ask. It's like, so what does it what what does what does it mean for you to be a three? What does it mean for me to be a three? Yeah, when you and, say you're a three, what do you mean by that? And I think that there are. A couple of things. Number one, I have a PhD. I know. A lot, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and, and this does not mean anything. I've been thinking about this. Most of our podcast doesn't. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is like because I know both of your fives. Uh huh. So I know a lot of threes and fives that start to go through academia. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. I was there at one point. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And I think that I know a lot of fives that didn't finish, mm-hmm. and I know a lot of threes. That will put their head down and just gut out something. You to be asshole. Done. <laughs> See, that's <laughs> what I meant. God, God damn, damn you. <laughs> no, but you know what? I was actually thinking of this. When I thought about it, I was thinking of this other guy who was like brilliant. The smartest uh-huh. guy in our doctoral program. And he didn't finish because it just was like he never had the drive to finish, uh-huh. even though yep. he was by far the smartest guy around, the most intelligent. Mm-hmm. I think the two biggest reasons why fives will drop out of academia, one is the drive issue. And a lot relies on your own drive by the time you make it into a Ph.D. program. Right? Yeah. Like, right? Yeah. That's the, what it is. It's and we don't have energy a ton of management. Yep. And two, if they suddenly realize, oh, wait this constant need to be seen as competent is an unhealthy thing in me and I'm better off if I let go of it, then suddenly it's like, that's oh, the good shit, version of I that. Do something else. That's the positive version of like, Oh, you suddenly recognize it and you, you let go of it. The, the other version of that is eventually that, uh, sense of imposter syndrome that like no, I'm not good it. enough. I'm not capable enough. Eventually, like it, it totally sabotages you to the point where you can't deal with it anymore. Like it's, That's true. it's it, it overwhelms you. It swallows you. And so, yeah. yeah. So I took an online test through the Enneagram Institute, and I got a 22 and and three, and I got a 20 and five. Mm-hmm. So they're pretty close. And as I started to read them, and I, I do this quite a bit, like I I start to run things through, like, well, I did a PhD. How did I do that? Like, because mm-hmm. that sucks. Yeah, like it's hard. Yeah. And so, um, and I was like, as a three, this high driven, um, like have to succeed, have to accomplish something, have to do something great type thing. Like that's what drove me through the PhD program. It wasn't just the, like, I really enjoy the thinking, but it was that. And, uh, and if you get to my bipolar, you know, the bipolar stuff when I'm manic or when I'm hypomanic and, and I can describe that more in depth later, but that yeah. really comes out. Like, mm. I feel like God, like a Messiah, and and I can act like it too, which is really annoying. Um, nobody wants to be saved by somebody that thinks they're trying to like by by someone who's running around being like, "Hey, I'm Superman," you know, like. And so uh, most time, except they go, the people of Gotham City. Yeah, except oh, shit. I no, just did. You did Batman. Oh my God, of Metropolis. You're an embarrassment. I wasn't going to say anything. I was just going to let it roll. My. So I mean, I'm sure he visits sometimes. Well, I think he, he comes to Gotham. Well, I mean, God, Batman goes to Metropolis. They're both on the coast, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. they're they're part of like a, a megalopolis. Aren't they kind of like Boston and New York? Kinda? Something like that. Uh, yeah. Even We're good. still, I mean, the DC universe sucks. <laughs> it's not our universe. You have a great point. Thank you. Okay. They so just anyway. they just yeah. Why couldn't it have just been New York? Like. It actually gives Spider-Man more character that he's he's just in New York. If you it's stop fine. playing the game and say Gotham City is New York, then then it's DC, fine. Then it stops sucking. Yeah, right. It's Gotham, and that's what they call New York. Yeah, but is Gotham okay, New York or is Metropolis New York? I think Gotham is supposed to be New yeah, York. Yeah, Metropolis is yeah. Gotham is New York. Or are they like Cause it's two the, different it's the whole sides thing, right? of like, New York? Gotham is. I don't know. Anyway, this happens a lot in our podcast where we get off on. Comics. We talk about superheroes a lot. Yeah, yeah, and I was just thinking For about the, the Wolverine metaphor that I have, but ooh, it's a good one. Mm-hmm. A mixed state for a for so for somebody who's bipolar has a mixed state, and that mixed state is you feel invincible and you want to die at the same time. So you're manic and you're depressed, and so it's like Wolverine. You know, he can't die; he's invincible. But he really would really like to at some point. 
So, and you might think that Hugh Jackman is hot, but it's not exactly pleasant to be Wolverine. You you are exactly. aware that actually he did eventually, just in the last few years, lose his like healing factor. Yes, and he he's dead. Yes, I yeah. yes I, Although, I watched that movie. I mean, in comic books, but that's like that's like way that's like way in the in the future. Um, in the, in the in comic the, books, I'm not sure it is. Oh, isn't it? Yeah, no. um, I'm not totally sure, but um, now. The other thing is in comic books, death is a temporary state. Yes. It, it never sticks. So, uh, so getting back. My to, next question is, uh, where were we? Uh, Superman and Wolverine and bipolar and feeling like Superman. When you feel like Superman, yeah, woo, uh, you tend to annoy people because you try to save them when they don't want to be saved, mm-hmm. and so and that can the, I can run into that problem at times. We were talking about. You were saying no. how you, you were back and forth between the the three and the five, and how I you was. got through the PhD too. And I did. Uh, so I got through the PhD, and I uh, so when I started to run how how I did the PhD through it, I realized that like while I love to think and love to 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 do all that around it, and I am I'm an introvert, so I'm an introverted three, which is fun. But the three is what really allowed me to to kind of to get that done, and and that actually. That, that, happened. that drive to succeed, yeah, or to yeah. at least be appear successful, yeah. Like, and then yeah. that happened a few years ago. I did a thing called the Dopey Challenge. Um, if you don't know it, at Disney World, they have a it's called a marathon weekend, and you can run. And they have a five k, a ten k, a half marathon, and a marathon, and they're on four different days. If you're an idiot, or if you're a dopey person, dopey challenge person, you run all four. In the four consecutive days, oh. this sounds like so, nothing but healthy. <laughs> so, so I did Excellent this, idea. and uh, it was a, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Um, I got to uh, sounds like I got to mile, I got to mile four, and what's even better is that in order for you to get through the parks and through the place, you have to like start running at like five in the morning. <laughs> so you have to like be on a bus at like two thirty to get to this place to get to run uh-huh. so i was up at 2 30 every morning for four days at disney world and you know what it was perfect because no one bothered me about going to the parks no one wanted me to mm-hmm. like no one was like you got to be in the parks you got to be doing this you got to be doing that like it was just like hey i'm going back because i'm tired and they're like okay like that's fine and i was mm-hmm. like and then when i'm like i'm going back because i'm having an anxiety attack they're like is there anything I can do? Can I can I help you? Do I need you to walk me? Do, no, I don't need anybody around. I just need you to leave me alone, yeah. please. So, yeah. anyway, so that was so anyway. So I kind of I looked at that like that was a six or that was a three thing to do. I was keeping myself up six, but that was a three thing to do. Like set set this goal, and I set the goal before I'd ever run a half marathon. So like <laughs> I had, I was up to I was up to like ten miles, and I was like. So I went ahead and signed up and got her going. Like you succeeded though. I succeeded. You yeah. succeeded. Oh, you there did was it. there was no I, like, you, and at, you knew you were going to. At four miles into the marathon, I was like, I don't know that I can do this. And then I was like, No, I've got to. I got to do it. I've got to do it. And so I just kind of I figured out a way to like put down <laughs> one mile at a time. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those miles were like fifteen or twenty minutes, but. Damn. Whatever, man. Just kind of kept rolling. That's so this crazy. isn't a story of um, aiming high and missing. Uh, you you absolutely pulled this off. You succeeded at the Goofy Challenge. Yeah, the Dopey. The Dopey Challenge. Because there's a Goofy Challenge too. Oh, okay, okay. I got it. I got it backwards. That's <laughs> so the Dopey Challenge. The Goofy Challenge is where you just do the. You just you just do the half marathon or the marathon. Okay. <laughs> Nathan was throwing up air quotes around those just <laughs> around the just yeah <laughs> for our, for our listeners. So okay, I would so hate you to see the dopey challenge. Yeah. I mean, I, I did a marathon. I ended up doing a marathon. So that was in January. And that was another fun part was that in December in Indiana, I was running like 25 miles a morning. Wow. But uh, I ran a marathon in October to kind of get to, to I, I ran it to raise money for uh, refugees. So I did that. And I was like, oh, I can do a marathon. I, I got this. That I was easy. It. So. And, that, and you can do four different marathons of four different lengths on four consecutive days. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Is it something that you're hoping to do again? So I hurt my back really bad. <laughs> oh, okay. Like like a month after that, and uh, I had to have rods and screws put into it. So no, there won't be any no. more. Oh, okay. If my wife or my parents got a hold of me, like trying to do something like that, like it would be it'd be a big deal. So so do you currently have like a challenge in front of you? 
So I just applied to become a to to start a counseling program. Oh wow! So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through and become a licensed mental health counselor through Indiana. Let me and I'm working full time and. So the reason I asked that is I'm wondering because and I'm happy to talk more about that too, but as a three, do you find that you need to have like some challenge in front of you or that it helps to have like some goal that you're working on? Yeah, and I need. And I almost need the pressure of it like coming down on me. So like I'm writing like I was talking about writing this book. Like I started in like January and I've kind of just tinkered with it here and there and stuff like that. Well, like, another guy on the board was like, You need to have it done by November first. <laughs> and I was like, Okay. All and right. like so that feels good and like I'm banging it out. It's having having some sort of like deadline helps me out quite a bit. Right. And having and having a project in front of me is really good. So, I mean, if it wasn't this book, I mean, like you said, now you're working on like becoming a mental health counselor. Yep. Is this, is there a pattern there though? Like, 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 um, do the challenges fill a purpose or like a specific role for you? Yeah. And part of this goes with the mental illness and part of it doesn't like, I feel better. Like I, I, I used to not like to have anything on my plate. Mm -hmm. I used to just like to be able to do whatever I wanted to do. But I've noticed, and then to like get, and I'd get like six things done in like six weeks or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I notice now that it's better for me to kind of keep on track with one or two things, and to allow those one or two things to um, eat my days up, and then to stay on with those. Like there was like like so I quit my job. I was working uh, with uh, for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I was the executive director of this nonprofit, and then there was some some stuff that happened, and I and I left the position. And so I had, so I've been off work for like th- four weeks, and that's been difficult because I don't have like I don't have like a mm. big job to do. Like I've got this book yeah. I'm working on. I got a couple other things I'm doing, but. It's never, it's not like a big deal. Does that make sense? And then, the, yeah. and then that is also like not having my time structured and like, I've got to be at work and I've got to do this and I got to do that. It's allowed me to be real loose with stuff and that the more that I have things kind of occupying my mind, my mind doesn't go to other places that are real dark and mm. nasty. So I can relate to that. I get that. Do you think like some of what you're talking about has to do with how threes can over identify with their role Mm -hmm. and so with that loss of role there maybe there's a like a little bit of crisis or i don't want to i don't want to overstate it but yeah i can see that i mean well the other thing was i was i was worried because like what am i going to do like i don't have a job Mm -hmm. you know like and that and that role does start to that does start to kind of play play a it makes you nervous Mm -hmm. and then and it also takes away a little bit of identity like i got a new job and I start next week and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's no big deal now. Um, and I'm doing something I like more. So that's, it, it all worked mm-hmm. out really well. Um, uh, and I won't be in charge, which would be nice. I'll be able to do my schoolwork and I won't be the, I won't be the person to do everything. But, mm-hmm. but I do think that kind of as a three, yeah, I do identify with like that work. And I have noticed that like, it's funny, I identify with the work and then when I'm done with it, it's kind of like, okay, I did it. I'm moving on now. Yeah. So like, yeah. like as a PH, like as a PhD student, I did the PhD and, and it may have been because I lived in Plymouth and no one really cared that I had a PhD. You and I at least had like some, uh, similar acquaintances. I don't remember if we both had the same DS at some point, like when I was pastoring mm-hmm. and when you were, you were, I think just a part-time youth pastor in Plymouth mm-hmm. for a while. And I, I can't remember what context you came up in. But basically, like the idea was, you're like the most overqualified, overqualified part-time youth pastor, like anywhere ever. <laughs> you have in the a PhD in theology, you know. I mean, rivaling, you know, like all the pastors in your area and their education levels. And I mean, it was, and that actually became a, an issue. Like, so I left uh, that church and went to another church to work, and was doing youth and young adults ministries, and like. I was never the person that was going to be like, hey, I'm the smartest guy in the room or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I could project that air. I won't say that at times I didn't think that. Yeah. But I was never going to be like, 
I was going to have the false humility, you know? So, but this, this one guy that I worked with was just like, you got a PhD. You're, 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 you're smarter than me. And it became a competition to like mm, outdo yeah. me or something. And it was just yeah. like, yeah, dude, like I, like there is no competition. <laughs> yeah. Like there's, I'm trying, but if to you're going to try and outdo me, then I'm, I'm not going to let you. Well, kind of, yeah. but I mean, there was really, I was just kind of like, I mean, at that time, like, like at this point I've written, I've written one monograph, I've edited three books and I've written 24 articles and many of them in peer reviewed journals. Like if you're a pastor with an MDiv mm-hmm. and like you want to start like piling up academic credentials, like he's not going to be able you're to do not, it. that's not happening. You can't do man. it. Yeah. So, and like, and he's like, I <laughs> that was always like, mm-hmm. I went to Duke with some of the smartest people around and I was like, I know those people and you're right. You did, but that doesn't. It's kind of like saying that, like, well, I went to med school, but I never did the internship, and I never did this surgery <laughs> yeah. stuff, but I can still do that. Yeah. It's like what you said earlier, you know, like, uh, academia is not necessarily about intelligence. It is about putting your head down and getting it done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, It really yeah. is. Yeah, the, some of the smartest people I've ever been around are not PhD. I mean, mm-hmm. the, like, it's simply a matter of, and getting your work done in a way that some, like, mm-hmm. some usually some weird guy <laughs> like the, that is your dissertation director gets it done. And my dissertation, director, he was a little strange. So, but he was, he was super nice and great and everything like that. Uh, he would find this fascinating, but for me, I've, uh, well, I won't say I've deconstructed the word smart, but I don't find the, the, the word smart to be very useful. Cause no. everyone just thinks like if, if, you know, um, I mean, I, I have my two master's degrees. I've, I've been through, um, I've made it partway through a, PhD program and then decided that uh, I needed to leave, but uh, I never felt like I was smart. Never. No. And yeah. And, and so, uh, and I look around and there's people who are accomplishing things that I, I, if, if I had known them in different contexts, I wouldn't be like, Oh, well that's a smart guy. No, they're just putting their head down and they're doing the work. It's not about being smart. It's about doing the work. And some people uh, have advantages. Um, maybe they're inclined toward this kind of work. But even if you're not inclined to, if you're willing to put your head down and do the work, you'll probably get through it and and, and yeah. accomplish those same things. Yeah, and, smart and, to me just isn't a very useful term. No, it's not a very useful yeah. term. Because and the other thing is like, like my wife works at um, a a gear and manufacturing company. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do that. Like yeah. she runs, the, yeah. she's the director of human resources, so like she's not doing it. But like she talks, she's like. Yeah, this guy was making this part, and he was doing this and calibrating that and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I got nothing. I could, I could not sit there and do that. Most mechanics don't strike me as people who, who most people would say, "Man, that's yeah, a smart guy. guy." Except that I don't want a PhD to work on my car. No, I want some guy who's been doing this twenty years and probably already has a PhD, like a practical PhD in in auto mechanics. You know, because he's been doing it. It's so about long, multiple right? intelligences. You yeah, know? exactly. There are people yeah, who yeah. have who have this like engineering brain. Yeah. Yeah. Where they, they, it's almost like they think visually in front of them Mm -hmm. and their hands are part of that thinking. My dad had, yeah. so when I was growing up, he had a, he had a garage. He'd work on people's cars all the time. He loved it and he was good at it. And he'd ask me to do things. I'd watch him do it. It's the most simple thing. I am not intelligent in that way. Like I can understand what he's doing, but I can't do it worth crap. I don't understand the, the mechanics of it, the process of it. I can't make my body do the things his body does. Well, and, and there's an art to it. Like, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. there's just something that, that some of that stuff does. Like, I have a friend who's, yeah, I think he's a three. And I, Steve, in an earlier conversation, and I talked about, I hate to, I would hate to put somebody in an enneagram, uh, like a category that, like, they didn't think of of themselves. Yeah. Hold it loosely. Yeah. But, but this friend that I have, I think he might be a three. Army guy, uh, and, and so a veteran, and uh, and he was one of the first people in like he would go through neighborhoods first in Iraq, like mm. to clear them and stuff. So he, he's, what did he say to me? He was like, I had I had training, I had training to have bullets whiz by my head, and that was no big deal, but this was a this was really tough, and I was just like, you've, yeah, wow. So it was just kind of mm-hmm. like that, but he's, he's a wizard. He runs this place called recon media and I'll always give them credit cause they help us with our, our website and stuff. But, uh, they, um, but he does, uh, marketing and, and stuff like that. And he just, 
gets it. Like school isn't his forte, but mm-hmm. like man, he gets this and yeah. understands it and is able to put together videos and uh, whatever else. And like, and then he's always driven to like the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Like, mm. it's cool to watch because like we're very different threes. Like he's much more like social, outgoing, like helping people out that kind of stuff and i'm much more like one-on-one um you know we're in this together uh and and kind of a lot of listening i pride myself on being the less the best listener available to people like that would be one of the things like Hmm. like it's funny like i used to always tell people what what i thought they needed to hear Mm -hmm. and i and i realized that that was really bad for people and so I've tried to switch around into because I, I have an opinion on everything, even if I don't want to get, even if I don't give it. And um, now it's switching around and being the the best possible listener, so that somebody can get to where they need to go. And that's a real it, that can be hard for me at times. But my wife's like, it's funny to watch you because you'll just sit there and like look at the people until they talk. And I, and she's like, I can't do that. I mean, she's an extrovert, so. But I'm introverted, so I can sit and listen to people, and they can breathe, and we're, I'm perfectly fine with that. So, Megan was loud. Megan is an eight. <laughs> yeah, I, and I was she is loud. Back. Well, I just, I, I just, I noticed there were times where I had to like turn my car radio down because it was. Yeah, because we're we're awfully quiet too. I, I was pulling her back a lot, but she was coming through my mic even. Right? Oh, was uh-huh. she? And so, in order to hear me, she we were getting more of her voice in my mic than in hers sometimes, right? Yeah. And 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 if I were to pull up the the files. Right, every time she laughs, I'm just yanking the volume way down. There are all these major dips, like all three bikes. I'll pull way back when she laughs because she just has that she, full. She laugh. is the loudest laugher that I know, and it's I love awesome. being around it when it doesn't startle me. Um, <laughs> but, but she is the loudest laugher that I know, and it's wonderful. She really like. I I think it comes through pretty well on the episode. Yeah, I thought it. Um, I mean, but she can, really has a genuine like an energy around her. And as a five, I know that there's two different kinds of high energy people. There are those who it's almost like they're vampires and they're getting their high energy by sucking it out of you. And then there are those who bring their own and you get to, you draw off their energy. Like they bring energy to share. And Megan's one of those. She brings energy to share. And, and so like, I feel like I'm actually using less of my own when she's around. As I was, thinking, awesome. I was, I was thinking about it afterward. She's very concerned about the image. We talked a lot about imagery for eights, right? Mm-hmm. And she did not like bulldozer Im- imagery at all. She didn't even like steam engine uh-huh. uh, imagery very much. Passenger train, she loved. Uh huh. And then but also see, the rage a, train. But she's a social eight. You know, passenger uh-huh. train makes makes sense for her. Yeah, does not make sense for the other subtypes. Oh, that's interesting. Her subtype is passenger train. That's why she takes issue with how we talk about eights in general. Because uh, uh, social eights are the subtype um, that look more yeah. two-ish. Right? Yeah, that's true. So, so maybe other for eights all of would you eights out there, you're still assholes. You're still bulldozers. <laughs> you're still bulldozers. You're asshole bulldozers. Yes. <laughs> even, even if you have a party hat on. Even if it well, that that's the seven. But I do I do think there are some eights who probably managed to put a party hat on, yeah, especially eights with a seven wing. I think I cut but, the joke at the beginning of Megan's where I said, "So, are you like a bulldozer with a party hat on without the party hat?" Yeah, I, no, no, you, you didn't. Did not. I did not. No, cut that. you didn't cut that. that yeah, that's such a bad joke. <laughs>
It's a, it, but it comes through. It, it the, aw- the awkwardness. <laughs> which the point of the joke was, it's not a very good joke, and it's just kind of awkward. And that's what's really funny okay. about it. And well, that I'm glad through. it worked because I probably should have cut that crap. Although, if people wanted to tell us how well it really worked, you could always go to our Twitter account and leave us uh, maybe like just tweet us and let us know if, if Steve's joke really did work or not. At E9 Podcast. At E9 Podcast. Um, or links, I mean, I, we've never re- we've never really mentioned it. You could just give us any feedback about the show at all and let us know how we're doing because we're because really just kind of we're floating out there without any. We're uh, doing this for the affirmation feedback at all. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I am. So far, we haven't gotten any. <laughs> I'm expecting to see lots, of, lots, so, and lots. So, actually, what what we need you to do is if you if you listen to this episode, please tweet at us. And do you have a Twitter account? Yeah, you can tweet it at N M Crawford, Nathan Mark Crawford, N M Crawford. Links and, to all these and more in the show notes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and and let him and us know uh, how he was. Um, particularly uh, if, uh, you know, I think he could be brought down a peg or two. That's uh, just my personal opinion. I was going to say that if it's negative, just just keep it at E9 Podcast. But if it's <laughs> if there's positivity there, I would like to hear it. Yeah, so. yeah. So anyway, back to actually doing a podcast. Nate hadn't done very much work with subtypes at all. And so I went ahead and pulled out a resource. One of the best resources on subtypes I think that there is, is just uh, Beatrice Chestnut's The Complete Enneagram. And uh, for each type, she talks about the three different subtypes, the self-preserving, social, and sexual. And I had a thought that maybe you were self-preserving. So where did you land on that? Yeah, so... Few things you I said, told Seth kinda... he was wrong, but Seth was really right. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, and that's actually part of that's actually part of this is that uh, a self preserving um, three has vanity for having no vanity. So uh-huh. the idea that like I like people to be like, oh, you're so humble, and I'm like, <laughs> damn straight. Oh, just yeah. don't don't say oh. that, but say it a whole lot more. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> don't don't really don't really this and this gets to like really kind of uh uh like a vulnerable place for me because like this is where I am I, I would really be at and another thing is like the um that she says is that there's an anti deception. I mean really you could tell me that you could you're going to shoot me in the face and I'd be better with it than you just pull, than you being like oh you're okay and then like you pulling out a gun and shooting me in the face like at least just be honest with me yeah. like and I, yeah. and I and I live like I'm very aware of people's feelings um, and I think that has a lot to do with the bipolar like people are always like all the feels like Hamilton all the feels like hey bipolar all the feels um, and so it so like you have all these emotions that are always readily available not not you have memories of them like mm-hmm. it's not that I'm always it's not that I'm always all this stuff at the same time, but like I know what it's like to be really happy about something. I know what it's like to be really sad about something. I know what it's like just to be in the middle. Like, and I and I have that availability to me at all, at, at basically at all points. And so um, I'm very aware of and in tune with people's feelings. Mm-hmm. I think that's where part of the the four comes in. But um, mm-hmm. but I'm also don't want to lie to people or deceive people. So, yeah. like, I've danced around things with people trying to tell them bad news or trying to tell them things that are hard without, um, like, trying to take into account their feelings, but also, but but the primary thing is that we need to get to the truth or whatever the truth is, you know, like, yeah. that this is a problem. Um, and so, and that's happened a couple of times with uh, working with some of the people that I've worked with, like you work with family members and, and they don't want to hear that their, that their daughter needs to, you know, be in a hospital or or something like that. And so, and at at some point you just finally have to say like, your daughter needs help beyond what you can give her. Mm. Like, and you've got it. This is the place you need to take her. Well, you can't help her. No, I'm, I am not capable of helping her. Like she needs to be in a place where she's safe and this is the only place around, you know, like those kinds of things. And so, um, so that whole, that whole not, 
not lying or or being truthful. I don't I, uh, the idea of anti deception. Uh, I think is really it, that runs real strong in. I mean, so does the. I mean, so just just. I mean, I think we could bottom line it. Just say you really value the truth. I do. You value honesty. You value like getting to that that point where no, this is what the truth is. But part of the reason why that's interesting is how it intersects with a three type. Yeah. Personality. If a three is about a certain kind of success, mm-hmm. then trying to be really authentic and honest in the midst of that uh, can lead to a lot of conflict. And and the tension that I'm picking up, and I think you're 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 really close to, is that the 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 core passion for the three is deceit, or well, some people say vanity, some people say deceit. I go with deceit, where that is like the, you know, they believe their own line, then everyone else believes that with them. But this is the three that really does want to try and get to the truth. The, and it's the best, there's a tension there. The most there. believable lies are ones that are mostly true, right? Yeah, like, yeah. The more true it is. Ask my wife, ask my parents. I, I probably can, won't. You'll just need no, to tell just me. Just to tell you, but yeah. uh, I can lie really well. Like, I can lie with the best of them. Okay. Tell big yarns and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> we, we <laughs> so, uh, yeah. In fact, when I, I was in, when I was in college, I... You're going to tell me everything you ever told me. No, 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 no. Yes, yes, I was. Uh, no, no, no. When I was in college, I called home, and I just got the news that I had to have gallbladder surgery. No uh-huh. big deal. So I call my mom and I'm like, "Hey, I gotta have gallbladder surgery." She goes, "No, you don't." And I said, "What do you mean?" And she's like, "You're lying to me." And I was like, <laughs> I, "I'm not. I wouldn't lie about this. Like, I, I just got off. You know, I just got back from the doctor. He said he needs to have gallbladder surgery. He sent him me. He sent us stuff. She's like, "I'll believe it when when they call me." And I was like, "Okay, I guess that's how we're gonna roll." All right. So, All right. <laughs> and so, so that's kind of so I I can lie. But the work that I've done, especially like in counseling, that's what I was going to ask, has yeah. been to really kind of be honest with myself mm-hmm. and who I am, and admit that you know I can be a liar, liar. You know, like Jim, you know, the Jim Carrey movies on HBO yeah, right yeah. now. So you've been watching that. Uh, my kids have watched a little oh, bit okay. of it. So yeah. anyway. it's just an odd reference to kind of pull up. Yeah, unless, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless Evidently, it's recent. Yeah. It's recent. Yeah. So we've. Yeah. I mean. A 1996 movie or whatever, 97 movie. Anyway, I was going to ask, like, with the three being that, that core passion of deception, and and particularly like they lie to themselves first, and they believe it, and then of course everyone else believes it along with them. It, it sounds to me like with the work that you've done, you've developed this this value of honesty, and and honesty starting with you, yeah. But then uh, wanting to be honest in all things um like not not just who you are but like you just you value honesty in in other areas now too yeah does that that sound right yeah and actually like i can look back like i can look back to like high school and college and uh and even after after college and stuff my self-deception was so great i mean i portrayed like the perfect kid and stuff like that and i I mean i knew you in college i wouldn't go that far well in college i i started to (laughs) I, you know, I, I wanted to be the outlaw. So <laughs> yeah, it's not, hard at all. not hard at all. Uh, and then, uh, but a lot of the self-deception actually came to my, my mental illness is that I had inklings that I wasn't right. And I went to a counselor and it was a disaster. It, it ended up, I got to the wrong kind of counselor. They, they sent me to a guidance counselor instead of a mental health counselor. And the guidance counselor, the, all, the entire time that I talked to him, his eyes looked like saucers. And so, um, it didn't work out real well, so it was a bad marriage. Uh, because I was being very honest with him, and he didn't need to hear that. And so, uh, <laughs> so that was that was that. But but I, but the you know, I was honest. Things just didn't work out. You know, yeah, I was really honest, <laughs> and he was just like, "Oh my god!" And so, um, but but it, you know, like I, I survived, so it's okay. And um, but I did. I put on a a, a good mask. And was able to portray like you know the good student uh, doing the right things, um, and and you know the best father that that kind of stuff. When when I had kids, it actually took my wife just being like, "You suck as a human," like kind of wow. thing. Like, I don't really want to live with you anymore. And uh, and she and I have I've told this story and stuff. And so it's like she was just like, 
you need to see somebody because you're a miserable human being. And I was like, no, everyone thinks I'm great. And she was like, yeah, but I, I have to live with you and I see you and like, you suck. And so, Mm -hmm. and that was her being, you know, the two pickle too. Like that was her being really nurturing. Like she knew that I needed to hear the truth and that that was what I needed. And so like she pushed me into a counseling session and he was like, God, you are sick. So, and that's actually what he said. He was just like, you're really sick. And I was like, no, I'm not. And he's like, no, really, you're, you're, you're sick. Like, you wow. need, and you don't want that to hear. Like, it's weird. Cause you don't want to hear a counselor say like, oh my God, you're sick. But like, it was what I really needed to hear to like snap me into. And that, that kind of first real like hard honesty, like with your wife and that, that first mm-hmm. counselor that you saw, you know, like, yeah. Cause you wouldn't want a doctor to be like. No, this, yeah, I mean, the cancer's metastasized, but it's not a big deal. No, you want to yeah. hear, you're sick and we need to treat this. Exactly. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and I've been going to the doctor yeah. and the doctor hadn't been doing anything and ended up, um, I had the, the, the counselor was like, you need to see a psychiatrist now. Hmm. And so um, I had to get a referral from my doctor, which was a huge deal. They thought I was betraying them. Um, and then ended up actually taking my wife who does human resources being like, we are going to sue you if you don't do this referral. Wow. Um, and they did. So, um, I saw a psychiatrist and she was like, yeah, the meds you're on don't work on you. So, um, so you've been taking stuff that just makes your pee more expensive, which is always a nice thing to hear from a doctor. And then she put me on, then we started the. It takes about three years to figure out what meds work for you. Mm-hmm. So and that's about. It took me about two years. So, um, and that was that was the start of that. Yeah. So I could, yeah, I can kind of see like that that journey of honesty where like I mean you were pretty. It sounds like you're pretty stuck in your own self deception, and it took some real, like like a real shock point to knock you out of it. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, like you think you're being like I thought I was being honest with myself mm-hmm. until until I wasn't, and then when I started having people being like. Nate, can you really do that? Like, are, are you really capable of that? Like, are you, is that the best thing for you? Is that, you know, like, and now these are all questions that I run through before I make a decision on something. Like, mm. But it's a lot of self-examination and it's, a, it, it really is a lot of pulling back and being like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not the greatest and the, and the best and, and my success. And this is something that I was going to. Uh, chime in with my success now looks different than it does uh, explain that um so uh, yeah my biggest success now is is that like i can hold down a job and i, I have a I, like i have a good family like those are those are the things that i look at and go those are my successes mm-hmm. i can go back to school and still and still do that and and, and part of that is too is that uh the meds i take make me hazy so it's really hard for me to do like I can't do high level research anymore, not like I used to. Mm. So, which you know, kind of, it, it, which is kind of a kick in the gut, because it's like that's how I define myself for so long. Yeah. But so it's like those are like little successes, like and the success of like really, like people come up to me and like, man, you really helped my niece, or like you really helped this. Mm-hmm. Like those are those are the things that that matter, um, you know, and. And that's kind of where where I am is that success has just changed. If tomorrow the bottom drops out, success is just surviving till it comes back. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and and, and my wife and I have been through that. Like, and it, it, I like to say, like, I like to think it's just a me thing, but it's like an us thing. Like, she has to go through that crap with yeah. me. So yeah, of course. And her personality is like insert herself into that so that she goes through it with you. Mm -hmm. And my personality is to kind of push her away and be like, I can go through it myself. So, so that, that makes an interesting dynamic as well. Yeah, sure. I have a similar thing. We're not married, but I have this similar dynamic with someone who was, who was a two. And of course my mental illness is not on par with yours, but it's a similar sort of thing where if I've, for example, yesterday, uh, I had a real low yesterday. And of course, the way I respond to those things is to castle up, do my thing. I've been doing this on my own for a long time. Uh, I know what works and success changes that day, right? Success for that day is, can I function at all? Yeah. You know, and if I can sweet, that means I'm not counting being vulnerable with people as a success that day. Uh, That's not even on my radar. So I, I 
push people away really hard at times like that. She takes that personally and she wants to help. Her response is, how can I help? And my response is, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, 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 it amazes me when, when you talk about your wife and you say uh, th- that the, the wanting to help is help, right? Just offering, even though yeah. there's not much she can do, that is showing care. I can't even receive that. So she wants to help, and I'm like, it would help me if you'd shut up. Please don't take offense, but also seriously shut up. I don't want your help. I don't want you to try to help. And I think that <laughs> I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna have to ask her about this. I'm- I say the I say the fuck word less with her, but I do say okay. exactly what I. So say. this is a representation <laughs> of your side of things, maybe what's going on in your mind, but not the exact vocabulary you you yeah, use. I, I have I have an amazing leash for myself that See, I use when I'm with her. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that, especially the de- person who used to have to be your leash she, yeah, in college. Yeah, she doesn't deserve. I, no, she doesn't all of, deserve all of, all of that. I. But also, my ability to hold back is diminished when on those days. Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a you lot have to be more super aggression careful. comes yeah. out. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I think that everybody's mental illness is like their mental illness. Like mm-hmm. so, like there's no like. You have it worse than I that I have it or whatever. Like sure. it, it all sucks. Well, let it's me all tell no you fun. one one of the phrases is that I think you you probably heard it. In one of the episodes, but like, for example, if I was talking to you about the Instagram, I'd say, you know, I can tell you what it means to be a three, but only you can tell me what it means for you to be a three. Yeah. I, so it sounds like similar with, with mental exactly. illness. Like yeah. I could, I could show you the DSM four or five or whatever it's at now, but it's not, it's not going to be like exact. It's going to show up in you differently in a, in a unique way. Yeah. And it's a diagnostic. You know? So you like, you tick off things and then you're like, oh, you ticked off enough of these to be. Yeah. To be whatever to, it is. To qualify. So, yeah. <laughs> to qualify. Congratulations. Uh, so, but then the other thing about, I think, mental illness, and, and I shared this in Steve's class, and something that I've kind of come up with lately, is that it's a self-isolating thing. Like, mm, yeah. I don't know any mental illness that's like, I need to go out and like really like hang out with a bunch of people and like <laughs> like and and or and, like, if you do want to, that it's going to be received well. Yeah. Ex- <laughs> I was, was going to say, <laughs> yeah. like when I'm, when I'm manic and I go to, and I go to the bar, like, it doesn't go well. Like mm. I'm annoying and people don't like me and they go, what is he on? And that kind of stuff. Um, when it, you know, like, yeah. So, because I'm usually, you know, subdued and go in and have a drink and walk out and that's about it. So, mm. um, so for me to like come in and start doing shots and whatever else is usually my wife tries to keep me out of those situations, but yeah, it doesn't always work. So we've kind of danced around, yeah. Mental illness. We've we've referred to it a lot, but I'm I'm interested in hearing. Um, well, I want to talk about it more explicitly in some way or another. So yeah, I want to leave that to you. Do you want to talk about like the enneagram and mental illness, like as well, a whole, and what you think about how that works, or or like what does it look like for you as a three, and how does your mental illness play into that? Like whatever track you want to take, I want well, you to leave you to take it. I'll go meta into micro. Okay. I don't know what those words mean, mean, but I trust you. Um, so I go I'm big, just big to small. Oh, okay. So uh, big to little, macro to micro. It'd macro. be macro to micro. micro. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. <sighs> Maxi to me. I did not take any economics <laughs> in uh, college. So uh, anyway, so like on a micro, on a macro level, I think the enneagram. It's interesting for 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 people with mental illness because I don't think that personality things work real well with people with mental illnesses. Okay. Like. Mm-hmm. Like I'm bipolar, so like I can kind of, and maybe this is just because I'm a three, but I can snake my way through to different and see myself in different profiles. Different, yeah. Okay. And 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 I could be comfortable. Like I could be, like there are times where I could be comfortable as an eight. Like, do like, you think that that's the chameleon aspect of the three, where that's yeah. the mask you can put on and if see, you need to? See, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. Okay. I think, but then it's also. Like I'm listening to Megan talk, and like I'm not saying that I know exactly how she feels, yeah. But like I know where she like runs out of energy, and like you know how to mimic it. Like yeah. you've, you've, yeah, you, and you, and you have to when you're somebody with a mental illness. I think, especially if you've got like bipolar or schizophrenia or major depression, like some of these that where these mental illnesses become all consuming, mm-hmm. that like. You have to learn to almost mimic the world around you in order just to survive. Like I know a girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think that that's true 
for a lot of mental illnesses, but I, I think especially for some of those major mood disorders and schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. Like I know a schizophrenic girl, and I see her about once a week, and we talk, and I always ask her how is she doing, how are, you know, and I uh, she knows when when I say how are you doing, I'm asking about how the voices are. Yeah, right. And she's like, this week they're not too bad. Or Satan came to me this morning and told me to do X, Y, and Z. And it is all that I can do right now not to do it. She's like, I came to the coffee house just to watch other people so that I'm not engaging in that. Mm-hmm. And even somebody with a border, like borderline personality disorder, what is it somebody says? They're like, love me, love me, love me, fuck you. Let me, let me, let me, let me, fuck you. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and they push can't you ever away. trust. They don't have any yeah. trust. That anyone does care. So they, what they do is they learn to like kind of trust people the way other people trust people and hope that that will get them through it. So like what the Enneagram does, if you'll be honest enough to find like a, a true, not a true self, if you'll be honest enough to put yourself in a profile, it gives you a starting point for that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But if you're not willing to take that honesty... And I think that yeah. this is probably true I for think anybody. That's, I think that's true for anybody, yeah. But but especially for people with mental illness, like we think we're being honest and what we're really doing is Is mimicking something else. Yeah. And then yeah. we can say, like, I really like this person. I'm going to I want to be like them. Even though you know that you can't possibly be like them. It's just a, it's a it's a weird thing. Yeah. Yeah, you're constantly isolated, but you know you need people. One reason why I mean we're not the first Enneagram podcast out there, and we won't be the last. What? But one of the reasons why I thought it was valuable for us to start one is because we had this growing concern that, especially as the Enneagram becomes more popular, that it's used carefully and wisely, that it's used in humane ways, that it needs to be constructive. And in order to be constructive, it needs to deconstruct us. Right. Mm-hmm. There's a somewhat more accurate mm-hmm. use of the word. It, the whole point is that it's it's either a useful tool for us to recognize what's going on within ourselves better. And so to handle that appropriately or it or it's not. It either works for us that way or it doesn't. So using it the right way matters and it takes a certain amount of self-discovery and self-honesty. So, for instance, I couldn't buy into the Enneagram until suddenly I recognized myself in it. Like, okay, okay. And one of the things that makes it difficult to type people as you're working through it with people is yeah. the whole point is that it's supposed to reveal more of what's going on within us and we're not necessarily in touch with those depths. Yeah. So the, it's this dance between hearing all of these things that could be going on within you and then maybe finally landing on something you recognize enough and then you explore it and see if you're right. And maybe yeah. it gets you somewhere. Maybe you realize it's a bit of a dead end. But you're you're trying to use what little self-awareness you do have to match up with what you're taking in about these potential like personality types or these potential energies. And you're trying to find a match there. And yeah. if you're not very self-aware, it's going to be hard to place yourself. Yeah. It's going to be hard to use the tool at all, right? Yeah. Some kind of introspection is necessary. And a lot of things can mess that up. And I think mental illness is one of the things that can mess it up. I'm, I'm wondering if you could almost describe mental illness. Like it, it's almost like it creates another layer of defense. Like we, I would say that the, the personality types are all uh-huh. a, like a defensive structure, a layer of, of habits, both, both like actual like outward habits, but also mental habits, ways of thinking, um, things that we've decided to believe that all are gauged towards like – I need a defense to make my way in the world. And it sounds like mental illness almost creates another layer of defense even around that. I don't know. Do, do you yeah. feel like that's accurate? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the defense, but the defense that it creates is a, it, it creates a defense and it's a really strong one, but it is one that it, wants to appear as a non-defense. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I'm I not, would say that I, that's true of the profiles as well. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sick. I'm so, seeing parallels with well, the way I, also, I would normally describe the defenses, but also and and the way mental illness acts. I, it just sounds like yeah, like, yeah. And I, I don't want to say they're the same thing. No, no, but no. I but think they're they're, they're, they're both isolating. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 definitely. And and I think too one of the ways, one of the ways that in the when the um, in both that you begin to break some of those bounds is is community. Like you start mm-hmm. to yeah, yeah, yeah. 
you start to talk about like there's a podcast out there. We'll just call it the E9 podcast that talks about the Enneagram and and in community. Like there's yeah. you know three people sitting around, and then it gives people an ability to, to sit there and talk about it in a similar ways talking about uh, mental illness and giving voice to it and then saying these are the defense structures that we put up is that something that is there like you need to begin to like kind of just kind of pull those away pull those away i mean that's that's what yeah. that's what you get after i mean that's what that, that's kind of what here here does at times um and that's what um other places do but that's a real that's something that gets down to the nitty gritty people because it's no longer about putting up these facades or these 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 van- and I and I, I sound like such a three at this point like no more lies. You sound like Rage Against the Machine. Yeah, maybe Rage Against the Machine was a group of threes. They, they, sure they, don't seem like they are an eight group. If there was <laughs> ever an eight group, uh, so um, so yeah, it's it's about you know breaking down these defenses and then putting and then being able to put put back together yourself as something that matters like and it's funny because that, like, you talk about the enneagram uh-huh. as a you start with the negative yeah like because that's this, what hits this is something that you know like, that's where ba- you recognize I, yourself i have bad habits and i still like that like i looked at my i i looked at it and i said self-driven was a goal-oriented mm-hmm. like, these kinds of things and i thought yeah, yeah that, sounds like, about right. that sounds about right like and I know that there are negatives associated with that. Yeah. But, like, those are the positives that are there to kind of allow me to propel myself mm-hmm. to a place where I can be better or something sure. like that. Um, and maybe that's the difference between a three and a five. But um, Well, I think your approach is, partly is I and think I also, you're, you're healthy enough. Is, I, don't, I don't know any of this. So Well, I, I think you're healthy enough. It's harder to type healthy people. And, and what normally happens with the Enneagram is, like, the negative stuff is what hits first. Like oh, okay. if someone's talking around the circle um, and describing each type, typically it's the one where you go, oh, shit, that's you. It's the bag of bricks. It's the one that hits. It's, yeah. it's all that stuff that you've want, not wanted to acknowledge about yourself, and now someone just put it right out there. And you go, like it's, it's hard to deny. That is me. Cause, and so it, 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 it's a sick feeling. For most people. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I do think, I'm seeing parallels with what you're describing about mental illness and the Enneagram um, and the way that we use it towards health, where, first of all, becoming self-aware about these things and, and in becoming self-aware about the, these things and being honest about them, they lose some of their power. And then you, as you continue to work on them, they lose more and more power. And, and these things that are part of our personality profiles that are described to us, they're compulsive, and we do them compulsively. I bought 700-some books compulsively. I don't need 700-some books, but I'm a freaking five, and that's how many I have now. Not only that, but I have Library of Congress tags on every single one of them. It's nuts, right? Do you really? I do. He does. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I have 700-some books, but... Yes. So, anyway, like because I'm a slob everywhere else, but my resources, my intellectual resources, I have them organized ready to be accessed just in case I ever need to, right? Because I'm a five. And so we do these things compulsively, but as they lose power over us, it's not like me having all these resources and being able to draw on them and being good with knowledge and, and analysis and all the stuff that makes a five, you know, like they're, they're, they're positive things. But if they're compulsive, they're bad. But as I break down the compulsivity of it and I'm able to offer it freely, like it's good. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of parallels there between wh- the way you're talking about mental illness and and how like you, the it can start to lose power over you within community, and, yeah. And and it and it loses its compulsive strength over you. Well, and it does the more, like I think that, I think what what all personality tests do, and everything that comes down to diagnostics, basically, uh-huh. is it allows you to see some self awareness, and then it allows you. And I think some of them do a better job than others. And I think the enneagram does a does a really good job. Uh, I'm not I'm not trying to to put that sure um, it's the best it's the best personality profile or whatever that i've had of myself in you know the last 30 you know 28 years or whatever so um but 
Did you have a better one when you were 10? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I was just, I was going back oh, okay. long enough that, <laughs> you, that it I, I covers I, them all. I think I had my first one when I was like 12 or something oh, okay. like that. So, okay. like, Be- best thing since Scooby Doo. <laughs> since Scooby Doo. <laughs> well, I, I, depends on. I'm really, I'm really kind of a shaggy, you know, not so much a scrappy. Uh, I don't want to talk about it, but I'm a Velma. <laughs> I, I can see you as a Velma. I'd be a Fred. Uh. <laughs> yes, you would. Yeah, you totally would be a Fred. <laughs> Fred is the three. Yeah. Fred is right? the three. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to be a Fred, but I probably would be a Fred. So, uh, uh, but I think that some, of, most of the stuff, the idea is to become more self-aware. And so I wonder, I wonder if, like, part of my skepticism is always that one diagnostic works for all people or one thing works for all people. And so I think that, and and especially for people with mental illness, there's a a setting where you have to do multiple things to get to people's um, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Approach it from several, because we're we're complicated and profound beings and we're trying to form all these ways of understanding up And you've put up stuff so that you can survive in the world and it takes multiple angles to kind of get at that. Yeah. To get what's in there. Like, yeah. Like, you yeah. guys talk about the castle for the five. Like, yeah. there's always a castle for the people with mental illness. And, like, oh, that's where yeah. people can never go into. Like, right. like no mm. one gets to go into my castle. Because my castle is where, like, like it's a whorehouse, you know? Like, not and not like the Texas kind. Did you say whorehouse or, or horror, horror house? house? Yes. Okay. Not like, not like the best little Because I was going to say, let's explore this. There is, a, uh, there is okay. a slight difference. Yeah. Slight I mean, it could be it, slightly. it could be the horror house where, of horror house, whatever, I guess. House of the Horrors. Ho- house the, of Horrors, the, where horrors. The horror whore house? Yeah. Can we work whorehound into this? <laughs> <laughs> I love whorehounds. Taste, taste of candy. Yeah. Oh, so, man. but yeah, it's a <laughs> terrible place, you know? So, like, I'm not going to take anybody there. And like yeah. I mean, like nobody mm-hmm. used to go there. Maybe this is a little personal. So again, feel free to not do this. But does your wife ever feel pushed away or rejected in that? In the like, because there is that too. Like I want to get in there and be a part of it and help. And 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 they can very easily feel. Yeah, yeah. So she feels a lot of times like I don't want her around, which is the uh, <laughs> the opposite of what is actually like true. Like, um, and even when I'm in those those darkest spaces, like just her presence being in the house is enough hmm. it's just the idea that if i needed to i could call or i right. could say something or whatever right um, and there was actually there was actually a really bad there was a really bad incident um and it's actually why i have this tattoo uh so if you don't know i have a tattoo all the way down my arm uh, sleeve i uh i expected her home at about 305 and she didn't she wasn't there with the kids she went and ran an errand or something like that and i was like wigging out like i was breaking and I can I can remember it like I was to the actual end and just started uh, and I started to hurt myself. She came in and was like, "Oh my god!" And so it was you know. So those are the places where you know my mind goes. And then um, she took she got me the the help that I needed and stuff. None of it made her feel good, but the fact that she was needed, like that I didn't for some reason her not being home at three o five and getting home at three fifteen or three twenty or whatever she got home. That was a break for me, and so that mm. uh, that ended up being. Then that was the last really bad episode that I had. I had another episode where I drank a fifth of vodka, but which you don't do. I'm not likely to. Okay. Um, one time, Seth and I split a fifth of vodka. <laughs> it was not a good night. It wasn't. No. And I decided to drive home. That so was a bad idea. It was. It was okay. I mean, not okay that I did it, but I'm I'm I made it successfully. I don't remember where did you, you live home? at that point. Short race. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. We thought we'd make mojitos or s- something like that. We didn't mix anything with the vodka. We just we just got vodka. It was basically yeah. vodka, and lime, and lime, sugar, and, lime and sugar, lime and sugar. But mojitos and are mint. made with rum. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it was, it was super dumb. So we tried. It was super dumb. We just it was, we just got mint and limes and threw it in vodka and and it, it, drank it straight. And we drank more than we should have. It was dumb. And uh, it was a difficult walk home, like the two blocks that I had to walk. And uh, I slept sa- sitting up, 
And none of it was good. None of it. I didn't enjoy it. That was a terrible nope. night. Not a big vodka person. I wish you wouldn't have brought that up. I, we're not going to keep it in. Not that this sure. is on par with any of your breaks or anything. No, 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 no. No, no. So I drank, yeah. I drank a bottle of vodka because I, I had a headache. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> a little hair of the dog. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I had this headache all day, and then I went and got acupuncture. I got acupuncture to make it go away. I had had this headache for like three weeks, and they were like- and the acupuncture just made it like worse. Like I was driving home and like, I just felt like my head was going to explode. And I was like, I know what I'll do. I will get drunk and go to sleep. And that'll be that. And so I was like, I'm going to drink it till I pass out. And I never passed out. Drank the entire freaking bottle. And, huh. and then I, I woke up in the middle of the night with my head pounding and they took my blood alcohol. So this was like 12 hours later and it was still 0.5. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. So I was pretty, I was in pretty, pretty rough. intense. So, and they gave me three shots of morphine, which was nice. So, anyway, it made the headache go away. So, the, the actually, vodka actually did make the headache no, go no, away. No, no, the three or shots the mor- of morphine. I was going to say the morphine made but, the headache so go away. So, in a roundabout way, the drinking the three, the, the bottle of vodka got my headache to go away, but it just took a little more time than I. Yeah, it was expected. a multi step process. Yes. And there was, there was yelling and screaming and me daring my wife to. I think I think this happened, <laughs> daring my wife to call the police on me because she thought I was a danger to myself or something. Do you think maybe you were? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay, I was. okay, good. I'm just I'm, we're just, just kind of <laughs> pushing back on the whole self awareness thing here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. Whenever I look back at these situations, I go, yeah, yeah. yeah I was Probably I was in pretty bad idea. shape. Yeah. Trisha deserved like basically. My wife, Trisha, she has full reign to basically do whatever she needs to to make sure that I stay alive is what it boils down to. And so and these and these things are few and far between. So, I mean, these are. Yeah. But uh, but it's kind of like you look back at them and you're like, God, I was crazy. I mean, like, that's that's just what happened. There was a break and I did some really dumb shit. And uh but it didn't seem dumb at the time. Like, it never does. It always seems like it's just flowing. Yeah, like, it, it just, it, like, yeah, you know, like, I had a headache, and I thought, oh, you know what I'll do is I'll just start drinking vodka, even though I don't like vodka, and I'll just pass out. And after an hour, I couldn't pass out, and I was really mad and angry, and the headache just kept getting worse, and I laid in bed, and I tried throwing up, but I couldn't throw up, and or at least I don't think I did. I may have thrown up. And then, you know, like, and then... Given your blood alcohol spends. level later on, you probably didn't. <laughs> I think you I think you took in all the vodka. I definitely... All the vodka. No. All the yeah, vodkas. all the vodkas. So, yeah. I mean, but it's... it's, And this also goes to the Achiever thing. If I was going to drink the vodka, I was going to drink, drink the, the whole vodka. bottle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, uh, if I me, think we reached it, that dark point, Steve. It could sound like I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not. So we'll just put that out there. <laughs> I haven't had anything to drink all week, so okay. like, we're, we're good. So Yeah, okay. Uh, you know you know who says I'm not an alcoholic? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know what it is. I had a really kind of out of nowhere question. Okay. Well, it's not out, totally out of nowhere, but you said when you look back, you go like, oh my gosh, that was crazy. Being in the mental health field, how do you feel about the term crazy? So I'm not really a big fan when somebody's like, that was an insane party. Cause like I've been to an insane party and, <laughs> and it is no good, no fun. <laughs> Same thing with crazy. <laughs> it was funny too, because like 
it's like one of those things like i can say that like but yeah most of yeah. people can't like yeah so yeah. anyway uh <laughs> so yeah i mean like i'm always a little bit like really you can say wild you can say uproarious i, mean, I don't know like because uproarious has the same ring to it as crazy but, uh, <laughs> yeah but there are other i think there are other terms it's kind of lazy but I'm, I'm trying to imagine me going to guys I was at an uproarious party, party last, last night. <laughs> you wouldn't believe how uproarious it was. Things got just a bit raucous. <laughs> just a bit, just raucous. A bit raucous. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> There's better language. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think it's something that we need to learn to move away from. And I'm not very good at it. I'm no. sure, I'm, man, if we went through back through the podcast episodes, I've probably if, used the term inappropriately. But if you're using the word to describe something that's crazy, like Nate telling a story and saying, that was crazy. Mm-hmm. That's what the word is. It's what it's used for. It's describing the thing. Yeah. It's when it's used out of context that it it's, tends to be more problematic. My, yeah. And my yeah. my wife, when I say, "Well, I'm crazy," she hates that, or I'm insane. Like, I mean, technically, I'm not until I have a mental until I have a break, and then and then I am, and that's, that doesn't happen very often. So you know, like there are people that I work with that their life it, is lived. They're in a, in a, a constant state, state of like of, crazy. Yeah. So. And that sucks. Is that a term that used no. in that way? Would you tell you is appropriate though? Like even as you just said, no, they are legitimately like in a constant state of crazy. I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't. It w- it's not like I'm going to go to like. It's be, not formal. It, uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm okay. not going to be like, "Hey, Diane, how's, I'm, your, I'm, how's your crazy self today?" I'm you using know, like, you as a resource right <laughs> now. To, yeah. Uh, the worst was when people describe, and this isn't the sway one way or the other politically, but when people didn't like what Donald Trump was saying, and we're just like, "Well, he's crazy. He's crazy. He he doesn't." You know, he said this and he's crazy. It's like, yeah, not really. I mean, he he knows what he's saying and he doesn't yeah. have that break or whatever like that. Like, yeah. and yeah, morally I, bad, I, morally bad. Yeah, crazy, what, what he's saying is, mm-hmm. um, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah, he's, what, a, he's an asshole. That's different than crazy, right? And I, I mean, what I think he's saying is problematic and and terrible and stuff. But I also, it's not crazy. Like, there's yeah, a, there's some thought process. He, yeah, he he's not insane. He's a, he, much of it's deliberate. Although I would say lots of Enneagram experts think that he's an eight. I think most people have pretty much landed on eight. And I think you could say he's he's stuck in his compulsions. You can see those the, the compulsions that come with being an eight. And I think his compulsions show up really, like you can see it on his Twitter account. It's almost like he can't help himself. So there there is a way in like, yes, it's controlled, but it's also like he's stuck in his his personality compulsions. Yeah. yeah. No, no, and I'm not like... Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, this this is all kind of another. Yeah, you know, yeah. But that brings me back to a connection that I was trying to make. Seth, you were noticing parallels and how these things are discussed, right? Yeah. And it'll take us a bit to get to where I'm hoping we get with this. But early in the episode, Nate, you were talking about diagnosis, just very briefly, about how it's like a checklist. You check mm-hmm. off enough things, okay, then you qualify as this. But what happens if you check off several things on the list, not enough to qualify as a diagnosis? But you're you're in that area, right? Because really, sort of the measure of mental illness, at least classically, has been, is this a pattern that's like massively disruptive to your life and the lives of people around you? And if it's not massively disruptive, we don't tend to call it mental illness. That doesn't mean you're mentally well, because mental health is like a goal to which we all aspire and, and need to put effort in. But mental illness is like a specific category of things have gone more wrong here. So it makes sense, especially since there's an entire category of mental illness called personality disorders. Mm-hmm. In the DSM-4, it was a it was a whole axis because the, the, it was the, an axial approach. There was a whole axis that was all personality disorders. They were separate from everything else. In the DSM-5, they've gone away from that and everything's more integrated a bit but still personality disorders they're like exaggerated personality traits to the point where this is a very unhealthy pattern right? and, and i've seen so people do try to make this connection yeah yeah it's like if you were to take a five's dysfunction i'll, I'll talk about myself here first yeah, and blow it way out of proportion then it's it looks like schizoid personality disorder right yeah. where it's like having trouble with relationships fairly non-effective isolation you know disassociation with the body uh-huh. a lot of those extreme dysfunctions for a five start to look like that mm-hmm. if you take a one and ocd yeah, like or a three would be probably narcissistic, three personality narcissistic, disorder. six paranoid. You know, some yeah. of them are like real clear connections you can make there. Yeah. But does that mean that mm-hmm. if you were to draw the health scale, because it's not something that a lot of people talk about, but the whole point is that you're measuring wellness 
like how well am I doing? Yeah, and using this as a tool as a tool as, as growth to become right. healthier. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it's easier to type people mm-hmm. when their dysfunctions manifest more. If someone's yeah. relatively healthy, you know, it's kind of harder to place them because the whole point is to free you out of those restrictive patterns so you can yeah. behave however you choose to behave rather than behave in the, like compulsive ways. So is like extreme unhealth where we start getting more personality issues or like mental health issues. That's one conversation. That's one theory. Yeah. There's this kind of logic in it. Here's the problem I have with it. If I'm a healthy five, if I'm a healthy mm-hmm. version of me, my mental illness does not go away. Yeah. The Enneagram is not a cure for mental illness. You, yeah. You're not going to Enneagram your stuff away. Even if I'm doing well, if I'm managing my, my mental illness well, I don't stop having this issue in my life. It's yeah. still there. Like, I think, I think I'm okay saying, you know, this is one way where it, it might help you to understand a five if you compared like an extreme picture of a five in way on health with which one was schizoid. Yeah. Maybe there's a useful comparison there, but you could be a type eight with schizoid. You could be a type nine with bipolar and, and you can be a healthy nine and your bipolar is not going to go away. Those of us in the head center tend toward anxiety and depression and things, but that doesn't mean you can't be all over the place like in any other personality type and have these. You can be, you can be a seven, the happiest person around and still have anxiety. Oh, in fact, oftentimes that is the case. Oh, that's sevens with depression. Come on. Yeah. yeah, That's a thing. I also think that, uh, learning some of that, learning that I'm a seven with depression, for Mm -hmm. example. Yeah. It also allows me to learn to, on how to, I think that if you learn the seven, learn some of your basic traits, your deficiencies or your dysfunctions or whatever, you can begin to attack your depression differently than, say, a three with depression. Mm. Or yeah. Right. Because it manifests differently. Well, yeah. it does. And, and five's anxiety and the three's anxiety, not the same. And the yeah. tools that you have yeah. at your disposal, that like the tools that you're really good at, that you have at your disposal, right. can Are be- different. Can be, yeah, they're yeah. very different. And yeah. then they can be- Use. Like, I'm thinking of people that I know that, like, I attack bipolar disorder as like something that I've got to succeed with, like w- what mm. my success looks like, and like that I've got to, yeah. I've got to keep under control or whatever. Right. Somebody else, um, you know, like a five might think might might attack bipolar disorder and be like, this is something I can think through, and, and it's not a, it, and neither yeah. one's a wrong way. It just is what it is, you know. As an so. illustration, I have this other project that I was doing really well with for a while, and now it's kind of defunct. But the passion for it hasn't died. I wasn't doing well with my mental health issue for a while. And then other things happen. And I just haven't figured out how to get back in, right? And so very recently, I realized when I was first getting started with it, I was able to learn how to do something new, which tapped into that five energy, that five passion to like learn and expand and take things in. And I drew so much motivation from that so much of my energy to start the project came from that i realized i could just do that again if i find something rather than just start my project with the way i was doing it before because i already know how to do all those things if i intentionally do it somewhat different so that i'm learning how to do something new mm. in it i can tap into the my my natural passionate response to that and that can give me motivation where i'm lacking it So it's not about like, how can we lay mental illness and Enneagram over top of each other and synthesize this thing? Yeah. That's not a healthy approach, but learning both languages or both lenses, perhaps as a way to understand my dynamics and how I work in a very specific way, Mm -hmm. not on the macro level where like we're talking about the same reality here, but more like these are both useful tools that can be in conversation with each other on, on a specific level. Yeah. Like a local level and be productive. Yeah. I think that makes sense. It's it's all about like, I mean, maybe this is overly simplified, but it it's about the self-awareness that each of them has to offer and the, and the, the ways that yeah. the pathway towards health that each has to offer and, they can and you need both. Other. And it might be useful and probably is to be able to partner them and work through them both at the same time. Well, and I think that like, because the Enneagram is still, if it's used rightly, it's a pathway. Yes. Mental illness is the starting point of the path. Yeah, yeah. So, like, mm. I think it would be unhelpful to be, like, immerse yourself in the Enneagram but not deal with your mental illness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Definitely so, not, like, not so not like it would be really necessary to, like, deal with the mental And it may be that in your dealings with the Enneagram that 
you find that you know because like for me like it may have helped you know in college or something like that some spiritual direction to like learn some more about that and then to be able to point back to my deficiencies and or my dysfunctions and stuff and then be able to start to be like oh maybe you know maybe a mental illness is there maybe something else or like these are ways this manifests but understanding that first i think is a is a good way and now and, and i say that as someone who you know has gone through a lot of counseling and, and that kind of stuff yeah. so like those are those are things that i really needed but i think that there's a there's a good for me I know that this tool will help me deal with stuff and it'll help me deal with relationally with people a lot better too. So to what degree do you identify with your mental illness? What is me, right? Is my mental illness part of me or something other than me? You know, people have asked me that a lot and that's a, and that's a really big question in the mental health or mental illness community or whatever is like, where do I begin and where does my mental illness or where? Yeah. Like those kinds of things. Like where does one end and one and one begin? And I think that there's two kind of answers. Number one is that there are people who live their entire li- lived until they were 22 and never had a mental illness, mm-hmm. never had an issue or anything like that. And then all of a sudden they develop schizophrenia or bipolar, or major depression or anxiety or whatever. And uh, and that's the, you know that 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 happens. Um, and so they remember a before point and an after point. And I almost wonder if it's harder for them because. They can remember being somebody who uh, did not have a mental illness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and then that becomes more difficult. I have my first panic attack at seven. I don't know what it is to live without a mental illness. Like right. I, I, this, these are, this is just something that I've, I've had forever. And so, like, I know that I'm not reduced to my bipolar disorder, but I also know that in order to talk about me. I don't know how to do that without talking about my bipolar disorder. Right. So, like, if somebody, if I was talking around somebody who who didn't understand or or wasn't kind of privy to the conversation or something, you know, I I might talk around it, but I wouldn't give it in. But still, like, the things like, hey, I can get sad and I can get happy or whatever. I'm a good listener or whatever else. Like, those things, I think, come from being bipolar at times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for me, like, I don't know how how I dissociate my my mental illness from me. Even though I think that there is a difference, I just don't know how to talk about that. Part of the reason I ask is because I've been a part of multiple conversations that approach this in different ways, and I've loved all of them, and they're pointing towards something, but it seems like we're having, like you said, this is an ongoing conversation. We haven't really arrived at something yet. So my first approach to this was with narrative therapy. This was like end of college right after, and I realized what a powerful tool it was for me being able to rewrite parts of my story, being able to identify different narrative threads. It was an empowering tool. Mm -hmm. And also to begin to disassociate myself from my mental illness. Part of what that did is it helped me recognize a healthy version of me and an unhealthy version of me and, and to know the difference and to begin to tell where I'm at with that. So I could, I could talk about, well, my mental illness wants to do this or whatever. To talk that way, which is a little weird, helped me recognize the difference between unhealthy and healthy versions of me, which was really good. So I, in a sense, there was a, a kind of, this is who I am without it. But at the same time, that doesn't mean it ever goes away and all that. So one of the other most powerful angles I approached this from was disability studies, where when you're talking about rights for uh, people with mental illnesses, or, or with a lot of different kinds of disabilities, we're talking about people who, for very good reasons, need to identify with whatever the impairment is. If you talk about someone with Down syndrome, you can't talk about eradicating Down syndrome from humanity, which oftentimes is spoken of as like a charitable, like positive thing, without talking about eradicating the Down's population. The idea of preventing all down syndrome from ever occurring anymore means eradicating part of the population and people with down syndrome see that as like a threat that's an attack same thing with autism we what if we could prevent autism okay but is autism not a legitimate way to be human Mm -hmm. so that whole conversation is super complicated and i think we're all over the place with the degree to which we are the things that are a part of us because part of what we're asking there is what does it mean to be human And we're kind of composite. There are a lot of things that comprise us. Part of the reason why I think that's fascinating is the Enneagram has its take on personality, which is that you aren't your personality. Your personality is an artificial limitation on you. But 
you also never get to stop being that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm forever a five, even if I can be a healthy version of a five and less limited by it. To what degree am I my personality then? Because in, in a way, this comes right back to the things you were saying at the beginning about true self. I never actually get to be my true self, asterisk. Like maybe in some instance, I might have access to it or something at some point. But I, I certainly don't get to own it or possess it. I don't really know who I am. Yeah, it's it, it's a weird thing to talk about. You're more in touch with, but it, you're never completely that. Not here, right now. We, I mean, we could talk about other other possibilities, but there's not much point to that. You know, we, you know, maybe maybe someday in heaven will be our. Well, yeah, maybe, but that's not that's not the reality we can aim at here yeah, while but, we're doing our work. But so that's another question. Like with Steve, like people are like. I've had people come up to me, especially in coffee shops. Coffee oh. shops are terrible. In heaven, you won't you, be struggling with this, Nathan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, when this, when you get to heaven, you won't you know, be bipolar. And I, I say to them, I don't know how to be me without being bipolar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what would that, what would that mean for me? Like, yeah. I don't know. And I think, like, if God can redeem anything, like, hopefully, God could redeem a mental illness. Yeah. Unless that, unless that's, that's a fascinating possibility. I don't know what to yeah. do with that. What, I what don't know what, what, do, what does redeemed like? bipolar disorder look like. Exactly. First of all, you'd have to drop the, the term disorder. Then, well, yeah. yeah. Well, apparently somewhere between Superman and Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. I'll prefer Wolverine. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Superman's way more interesting than most people give him credit for. I'm just going to throw that out there. Well, I know, but. Uh, uh, are there any five superheroes? Have we talked about this? Professor Xavier? Maybe. He's got a lot of charm for a five. He might actually be a three, too. Dr. Manhattan might be. There's one thing I, I think I'm coming to realize is I think there's a whole lot of ones that are both superheroes and supervillains. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, it's which, because of the whole, like, light-dark thing. Yeah. Like, struggle for evil versus good. And I was thinking about the uh, Megan's episode earlier today because uh, someone tweeted out about the upcoming Captain Marvel movie. Oh. And how it's it's heavily influenced and, and, and the character the Captain Marvel character is based on a particular run of Captain Marvel, which is very recent. The comic book writer's last name is Deconic. It's it's an excellent run. I've read part of it. And the, the writer says about her version of Captain Marvel, she says that Captain America gets knocked down and he gets up because it's the right thing to do. Captain Marvel gets up because fuck you. And I thought, a female Enneagram 8 is the superhero that I want. <laughs> <laughs> that is the superhero that I want right now. You can't have it. Once you get this stuff in your head, it's a virus. It never gets out. That's what I'm saying. Awesome. Can we at least agree that Captain America sucks? I don't know. I mean. He's he's the he's the worst. <laughs> First of all, here's the, th- the the concept. How do you how do you remove the concept of Captain America from like his origins of like the the, the whole like. Uh, World War II nationalistic brouhaha in which he was created. It, that, that to me, it's just problematic to try and keep creating something out of that. Could we have a comic arc where we explore, a la Superman Red Sun, what would have happened had Captain America... Is Captain Soviet? No, Nazi oh. Germany, man. Oh, whoa. Yeah, just, oh just drop him, same time period, just drop him on the other side of the ocean. So he would be Captain... Captain, Captain Fatherland. <laughs> Deutschland. Captain Deutschland. That has potential. Could really go wrong. That could be interesting. This is B-roll as hell. Anyway, Nathan, is there anything else you would like to say? Anything else you've got in you that you want to get out? No, I can't believe you called me Nathan. I've, I've been going back and forth the whole podcast, have actually. You? Yeah. So I, I know. I've Ways to get in touch or things to plug? Uh, things to plug. We can go to hearhear.org, H-E-R-E-H-E-A-R.org. Um, you can get in contact with me through there um, or on Twitter at NM Crawford or Here Here Org. Yeah, see us on Facebook. At, if you look up Here Here, H E R E backslash H E A R. Uh, I think that'll get us. So, again, we'll have links to all that stuff in the show notes yep. yeah. to make it easy. Yeah, and if you need help, text START to 741 741. Um, that's a, if you have. Um, if you if you feel suicidal or you feel like you can't, aren't going to make it, text them and they will get in touch with you and and can help you out. So um, that's about it. That's what I got. Thanks again for coming and yeah. hanging out with us. Thanks for letting me. Yeah, I, for, this was fun for so, talking so. talking booze and mental health and comic books. It's like everything we love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, nothing, nothing yeah. like talking booze and <laughs> booze, mental health, <laughs> and comic books. A little yeah. bit of God. 
Uh, <laughs> these are all of my favorite things. Uh, so you've got beers tonight? Yeah. Awesome. Once again, this has been the E9 Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at E9 Podcast. You can follow me at Seth Harshman. And you can follow Steve at Skeptical underscore Mom. Thanks again for listening.